Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to City of STEM's Innovation Day. We, my name is Dr. DJ Cast, and I am the Director of STEM Education of the University of Southern California's Joint Educational Project, and I am going to be your host throughout all of the wonderful activities that you are going to see today. City of STEM Innovation Day is um, here to show everything that's wonderful about STEM. There's going to be lots of different organizations that are going to demonstrate how they've been innovative in STEM with problem solving, inventions, lots of different things that make STEM uh, very special and what we all get super excited about when it comes to STEM. Uh, we are also going to be highlighting several amazing opportunities for you to get involved in innovation here in Los Angeles. Um, we're going to take a few minutes to also thank the sponsors of City of STEM Innovation Day and cue to the video. So thank you for watching our sponsor video. Our, our first contenders for the City of STEM Innovation Day today is the FTC uh, Robotics Team Lockdown, and they are going to do a behind the scenes look on how they build, design, and program the robots for their first tech challenges, which they've all had to do remotely, especially because of COVID for this last year. Um, you'll be able to explore how the team applies the ideas behind creating these robots with very basic physics concepts, uh, but with a hands-on activity. And so if you're going to be watching that, make sure that you have some materials ready for yourself um, to participate with them. And those materials include a coin, a hard ruler, a marker, and an eraser. Part of um, this, uh, the robotics lockdown and these behind the scenes look that you're gonna get from uh, FTC, not only you're gonna get a, a virtual tour of their robot, they're also going to demonstrate how you can make a robot move, um, an intake me mechanism. So for them, how uh, they collect plastic rings around an obstacle course and a shooting mechanism. So how do they score points when they are in some of the particular competitions? FIRST was founded in 1989 by Dean Kamen. As an inventor, he realizes that the way to have the biggest impact is to create a whole generation of new inventors through hands-on, engaging robotics challenges. FIRST ignites passion in STEM for kids ages 6 through 18. There's four worldwide programs. Once you get the challenge, you figure out your game plan. You make a robot and you code on it. Throughout each of our programs, teams embrace first core values. Discovery. Innovation. Impact. Inclusion. Teamwork. Fun. Hi, everyone. Um, welcome to our program. Before we start, please feel free to ask any questions you have down in the chat, and we'll be sure to answer them at the end. So we're Lockdown 8564. We're a community robotics team based in the San Gabriel Valley. We compete in an organization called FIRST, and we just wrapped up our seventh season of competition this year. Uh, today, we're excited to show the work we did during our 2020 to 2021 competition season. I'm Helena, the other co-captain and the non-technical lead. And I'm Yanni a member of the non-technical department. So what is FIRST? FIRST stands for For Inspiration and Recognition in Science and Technology. Founded by Dean Kamen and Woody Flowers, 
the organization was founded to inspire future generations to explore STEM and technology, become leaders within STEM, and become well-rounded contributors to day-to-day -day society. FIRST is divided into different divisions. We compete in a division called FIRST Tech Challenge, or FTC. This is for grade level 7th through 12th grade, and there's over 8,000 FTC teams globally. And every year, the object of the season is to design, build, and program a robot to on a two versus two format, where two robots will work together to score a higher score than the other two robot alliance. Matches are broke up into three distinct sections, the first being autonomous. This section is the first 30 seconds of a match, where robots need to complete some tasks on their own. This often involves the use of various sensors, as well as pre-programmed instructions. The next section is called the tele-operated section, or tele-op for short. This lasts for one minute and 30 seconds. Here, drivers manually control the robots and are often tasked with completing some sort of repetitive action to score points. Finally, we have the end game. This is the last 30 seconds of the match where drivers can complete a high risk task in exchange for a lot of points. So now that we know the basic match structure, let's explain what this year's game specifically is. So this is the field we're currently playing on. Due to current circumstances, robots currently play a solo match on a half field. However, during a normal season, a robot will play on a field that's twice the size with four times as many robots. So let's start with our autonomous task. This year, there are four of them. The first one involves moving this obby shaped structure called a wobble goal. We are tasked with moving into one of the three squares in the edge of the field. The square that we move it into is all determined by something called the starter stack. The starter stack is made up of these yellow rings. It can be at, at, at a height of either zero, one, or four. And based on how high it is and what the robot sees, the wobble goal goes in a specific square. Next up is a simple task called parking. All this involves moving the robot onto the white line. The last two tasks in the Thomas period both involve shooting the rings. The first one involves shooting the rings into the tower and the goals in the tower. The other involves hitting these small poles called power shots and knocking them over. Remember, robots complete these tasks all by themselves with no human intervention. Now we move on to the tally op period. This phase is rather simple as there's only one thing to do, that is shoot the rings into the tower goal. Now the final phase, which is end game. The two high risk tasks in this phase are knocking down the tiny power shot poles with rings and lifting the wobble goals over the wall and then dropping them in the drop zone. So this is a brief overview of our robot and its subsystems. We have the gripper and arm, which is used to manipulate the wobble goal, the drivetrain, which lets the, dri which lets the robot move around, and the intake, which sucks the ring into the robot. We also have the flywheel shooter, which launches the rings, and the camera, which lets the robot see. So let's dive into the details of each of the subsystems. Um, we'll start with arguably the most important part of the robot, which is the drivetrain. The drivetrain is what, the, what lets the robot move around. So our drivetrain features something called Mechanum Drive. It uses these special wheels, as you can see on the top left, called Mechanum Wheels. These Mechanum Wheels allow the robot to move in any direction. So it can move forwards and backwards, and it can also strafe side to side. Each wheel is independently driven by a motor called a Nevrist 40. After all the gear reductions through our powertrain, we end up with a 27 to one drive ratio. That means that for every 27 revolutions of our motor, our wheel turns once. Our drivetrain is fabricated through this material called medium density fiberboard or MDF. And we used MDF because of its low cost and high strength. We cut out each of these pieces of our drivetrain based on a computer model with a machine called a laser cutter. We also designed this drivetrain to have many mounting holes, as you can see here, so we could add new parts and subsystems really easily in the future. Next up, we have our intake. So this system is in charge of picking up the rings from the field and moving them into our robot. We accomplished this by using a set of rollers with compliant wheels, that's these green things over here, and sweepers with zip ties. The compliant wheels are really squishy and grippy, so they're good for catching the rings and feeding them into our robot. And the zip ties are good for moving the rings 
large distances once the compliant wheels have captured them. This whole thing is driven by a single 40 one motor. And we also designed this intake to have an arm right here out in the front that folds out at the start of the game. So when before the game starts, it's up and this lets us um, fit within the, the size constraints of the competition. The robot can't exceed like an 18 inch cube. And two, it also gives us better reach when trying to in rings once um, the game starts. So this is our flywheel shooter. It's in charge of launching the rings once the intake pulls them into the robot. The intake will then deposit the rings into our gravity hopper where they are ready to be launched. We use a design called a flywheel shooter to launch the rings. Our four inch flywheel is spun up to a very high speed with our two motors. It reaches about 6,600 RPM. In this state, it is storing a lot of energy. So the, mo so the moment we touch a ring to it, the flywheel grabs it and it spins it around really fast. When this happens, the energy stored in the flywheel gets transferred into the ring and the ring gets launched. With our design, we're able to launch rings up to 20 feet away. This is the subsystem we use to move the wobble goal during autonomous and end game periods. It works by clamping onto the wobble goal. We use a servo motor for this. To prevent the wobble goal without it falling out of our grasp, we use compliant wheels as a grip surface. The whole arm is rotated using a high torque 104 to one motor. Now let's talk about how the robot moves itself around during the 30 second autonomous period. We use a set of sensors to let the robot detect its surroundings. The one that we primarily use is the camera. This sensor allows the robot to accomplish things like image recognition, color detection, and much more. Basically, it lets the robot see. Another sensor that we use is a gyroscope. This tiny sensor allows the robot to know exactly what angle it is facing at any given moment. Finally, we have the motor encoders. These detect precisely how many turns each of our motors have made. So the camera is used to detect how tall the starting stack size is. This is critical because the height of the stack determines where we move the wobble goal. Once we, knows, once we know where the wobble goal is, we utilize motor encoders to precisely move the robot to cor the correct position to deposit the wobble goal. Finally, the gyroscope is used to aim our robot to the exact angle needed to be lined up with the goal so that we can score the rings. All right, now it's demo time. So we're going to switch to a view of the robot, which is live. And then we'll give you a run through, which is um, of what our robot actually does to give you a good idea of it. So starting from the top, um, as you may have remembered, is a drivetrain. So our drivetrain lets us move in all directions. So that includes forward, backwards, as well as side to side. We can also do a combination of this as by turning and strafing for any combination of these movements. Next up, we have our intake. So, then, so like you saw in the presentation, our intake can fold out like it is going to do now. So this intake is capable of intaking the rings. So what we do is we spin the intake up and then we drive up to it. It's kind of loud, so I'm going to do this while I'm not talking. As you can see, it picked up a ring, which may be hard to see, but it's in there. And then once it's in there, we can pick up several more, so up to three. In this case, I'm going to pick one more. So once they're in our hopper, we can spin up our flywheel, and then we can fire the rings. It occasionally gets jammed, so we like to take more than one whenever we do this. Um, so now we'll start demoing our wobble goal arm. So this is one of the components in charge of our main endgame task. So this is the arm that's closest to us that's going to fold down. And so what we do with this is we line it up with the red wobble goal over there, drive slowly up to it, and make sure it's within our grasp. Once it's there, we grip onto it, and then we can lift it up like so. Now, like this, we're able to move it around anywhere in the field while still maintaining grasp. And then when we're ready to dump it over the 12 inch high wall, we can move it into a position where it is ready to be dropped. And then we can release it and that is scored. This won't look quite like we have on the normal field because this is just a setup demo field, but in a normal competition, this is how it would normally go. 
Um, so that's the end of our demo. If you'd like to see more of it, we can always switch back to this camera later. Um, we're happy to answer questions about this. Cool. And um, Yanyi, how can people in the audience um, get involved in FIRST? Yeah, OK. So you can start by researching local teams around your area by searching FIRST Tech Challenge teams and events. You can contact the coach about recruitment. The LA FTC organizer is also available to help, and you can contact them at community at firsttechsocal.org. First has divisions for all ages, so find the one that applies to you. And please feel free to contact us. Our email is at hi at lockdownrobotics.org, and you can find us on both Instagram and Facebook at lockdown8564. Our website is also at lockdown8564.weedly.com. So thank you all for tuning in today. Um, before we answer some questions, we'd like to thank our sponsors this year, which are Base Systems and Actuonics Motions for helping us reach our ultimate goal. As a community team, we don't have any guaranteed funding every season as opposed to a team that is um, school affiliated. So we rely on sponsorships and fundraisers to fund our season. So we really appreciate the support we received this year. All right, so let's answer a couple of questions. We have a question um, on how can we get into robotics if we are first starting? So um, once again, we would, what we would do is um, you can search for teams around your area using first tech challenge teams and events, and then you can contact their coaches. Usually the FTC season starts up at around August, September-ish. And um, first is divided into different divisions. You have the elementary to middle school division, which is first Lego league. Then you have first tech challenge, which is middle through high school. And then you have first robotics challenge or FRC, which is just high school. So it's the, um, it's the division that applies best to you. Um, let's see. We also have a question pertaining around the drivetrain and using MDF. Um, Aaron, do you want to go more into depth on sort of how you guys built the drivetrain? And then also going off of the design and build of the robot, um, what was the decision like to make zip ties? Like why zip ties for the intake? All right, and then we have a question. What if you like robotics, but don't know anything about them? Can you still join the team? So Yanyi, you're new. Why don't you speak about that? Um, yeah, so this is my first year on FTC lockdown. 
And uh, going into it, I didn't really know uh, that much about Roblox either, but every robotics team has a technical and a non-technical department. So if you don't know much, I highly recommend going into the business side of robotics, trying that out. And, you know, during like practices or meetings, if you find that, hey, building robots look kind of cool, you can always try and join the technical side of it and from there develop your interest. Yeah, and also adding on to that, um, being on a robotics team doesn't necessarily mean you need to know everything there is about robotics. It's really just about sort of cultivating and like fostering an interest in robotics. That's why we do this. So if you don't have any prior experience, um, most teams don't expect you to, because unless you're in robotics, um, the opportunities to really build one are sort of limited. So you can totally join a team even if you don't necessarily have the experience. As long as you have the interest to learn about robotics, then you're perfectly fine. So we have a question. Was there something that went easier because of the remote working conditions? I think it really depends on what department you're talking about. We can, we can talk a little bit about how our season worked this season in par particular. Um, for the non-technical side, which is the business side, it was easier because um, Yang Yi and I, and also our other teammate, Pai Lin, uh, we were able to do a lot of our work over Google Hangouts. So, I mean, our work is over social media and we just correspond via email. Um, so that went easier because we could do everything online either way. Um, Aaron, how did building the robot work this year? Oh, Aaron, I think you're muted, by the way. in the future. I would say this season may not have been our most successful, but it certainly provided us with some new opportunities to learn a few things. Yeah, and just the whole, just the way the team functioned this year was very different than previous years. In previous years, the whole team is able to, you know, meet in one workspace and sort of branch off and do their own things. Obviously, that couldn't happen this year. So, I believe what the build department did was each build member specialized in a certain subsystem of the robot. So whenever they would meet one-on-one -on -one at Aaron's garage, they would um, just work on that specific um, subsystem of the robot. And then our programmer, Kyla, whenever she needed to do programming, she would actually take the robot and um, do the programming work from her house. So yeah, it was a very interesting dynamic. And then we just had, you know, check-ins every week with the whole team over Google Hangouts. So if there's any more questions, we would love to answer them. Um, let's see. Yen Yi. So we're a community team. So we're not um, funded by a school. Do you want to talk about how we sort of do that? Because I think the way we operate is it's slightly unconventional as opposed to like a school team. Yeah, okay. So 
Yeah, we we kind of start out every season with pretty much zero dollars in the bank account, and uh, from there it's just reaching out to different companies, applying for grants constantly. Um, and you know, like we ended up getting a few from like Actuonics and Bay Systems, and uh, pretty much, yeah, sponsorships are just how we fund the season. And I think well, our budget this year we reached. Around one thousand dollars. Yeah, it was around there. Fully from grants. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and our our budget is, I think, dictates a lot of the build of the robot. Right. Uh, in like terms of like material, terms of the material. And what we are able to get. Right. So, um, I think the build department often reuses a lot of the old parts from previous seasons of the robot. Um, Let's see. Let's find a CAD render of the robot. So um, these Tetrix channels um, that you see here, that these metal parts, they I think they date back from the very first robot, right? Yep, yep seven yeah. years ago. Seven years ago. So these parts are recycled from seven years ago. The mechanum wheels, I think, are three years ago. A couple ago. years, three years oh, ago. Maybe, maybe two. Yeah, so, you know, it's a lot of, resourcefulness on the end of the on the build team but yeah we try to do our best um okay we have a question if we don't know anything but want to get into first tech challenge or can we slash do we have to join first lego league first so the way that divisions are split up is not necessarily experience it's um what grade level you're in so um first lego league is fourth through eighth grade. So um, if you're between those grade levels, then that's what's eligible to you. If you're in seventh, eighth grade, and you're in between first tech challenge and first Lego league, um, I don't think it'd be too, I don't think you necessarily have to start out in first Lego league. Um, I didn't start out in first Lego league. Last year was my first year, and I started out in FTC. All right, so um, what else is also? Oh, Yan Yi, what's the robot's name? Our, OK, we never came up with an actual name this year, but uh, I thought that it would be a good idea to name the robot Aaron, but Aaron did not. so. We never ended up naming the robot Aaron, but Aaron Tim was, was a runner yeah. up. Tim was a runner up. It was a favorite from the coaches and not popular. I still think the, the robot should be named Aaron in honor of our only senior, but if he doesn't yes, want to, our only senior this year. Oh, yeah, we didn't mention we're all high schooler. We're all high school students. Because we're a community team, we accept students from different schools. So Yenny and I go to the same school, but Aaron is from a different school. And we have people from four different high schools this year. So it's always fun meeting new people. Um, ooh, another fun one. Aaron, how, why is the team called Lockdown? We'll end up with that. So the team is called Lockdown because it's the, the most prevailing story is that the original founding members seven years ago had to come up with a team name. So they decided to pick some character they like, and it was a transformer named Lockdown. So that's basically how the team came about. Um, another one is based off a motto called um, Unlocking a Better Future. So that's how the name Lockdown could also be, came could also have come about, but we don't quite know. But those are the two prevailing stories. Yeah, so we just have went along with that ever since. But yeah, um, I think we're reaching the end of our program. If you have any other questions, please feel free to contact us. Um, our contacts are right there. And thank you so much to City of STEM for having us. And we hope you guys enjoy the rest of Innovation Day.
Wow. That was so much fun watching FTC lockdown session about a robot potentially named Aaron. Um, and I love the way that this was engineering applied in such in like a competition setting. I think they all had to be very innovative to be able to both design and build all of those components and control them remotely. Uh, I know that some of my students, I think, would love to meet you all and uh, maybe control your your robot from their homes. Um, so uh, I'd love to get in contact with you all as well. I think it was wonderful. Um, if you want some more information on them, uh, there is going to be a um, website link put up in just a little bit. So feel free to click that and learn more. Uh, thank you all so much for being with us today as we wrap up like the entire almost a month's worth of um, City of STEM programming that they've done virtually for this year. Um, they've offered lots and lots of different programming since March 27th, which was a really big kickoff event. And since we can't, we don't have time turners and we can't go back in time and have you see them all live, we did record them all and they are on this YouTube channel if you would like to check them out. The, uh, the City of STEM kickoff event on the 27th of March uh, had lots of different content for families uh, and included Bill Nye, the mm -hmm. science guy, and Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. There was also a STEM career day, a STEM educators day, Earth Day, and of course today is Dear STEM Innovation uh, Day here in Los Angeles. And each of these, um, if you want more details about why those days were set up, um, those details can be found at a cityofstem.org website. And um, we are also on all of the social media channels. Um, so at City of STEM on either Facebook and Instagram, Twitter. And of course, since you're watching this on this YouTube channel, we would love for all of you to subscribe to the YouTube channel. So you'll also see further programming being promoted on here as well. Um, so for the rest of what we, or for our next um, person that we're going to, our next program that we're going to have talk during your, our show today, uh, we have a very exciting discussion from South LA Robotics. Um, but before we get to their segment, uh, we wanted to do a shout out to David from South LA Robotics. Um, David is a, a student and a participant of uh, South LA Robotics and unfortunately was involved in an accident, uh, but thankfully he's now on the mend and at home recovering. So David, we, you are in our thoughts and all of City of STEM is rooting for you and we hope that you're, you heal quickly. Um, if you would like to hear some more information about David's story, uh, we are going to link that in the chat. If you, also, if you would like to provide help and support, you can reach out to us at info um, at cityofstem.org. Um, and um, let's see. And we have um, all of the South Los Angeles Robotics. Um, is, are you ready to go on? Oh, yeah. Ivory Thompson. I'm 15 years old. I've been working with robots for two and a half years. This year, my favorite part of being on a team was to learn to drive a robot and try to gain the most points in under a minute. 
My name is Nicholas and I'm 11 years old. I have been working with the robot since 2018. My favorite part of working with a team this year was driving the robot and trying to get the most points in under 60 seconds. Hi, my name is Zoe Garcia and I'm 11 years old. I've been working with robots since 2019. This year, my favorite part of being on a team was learning about robots and learning to drive them. My name is Caleb Tate. I'm 13 years old and I've been working with robotics for about half a year. Like this year, my favorite part of being on the team was learning to drive robots. Hi, my name is Genesis. I'm 11 years old. I have been working with robotics for, I think, a year now. Uh, my favorite part about being on the team was learning how to program the robot. And um, I struggled a little bit because I had no partner to make the robot with. But it was still really fun. Hi, my name is Jesus Brooks. I'm 11 years old. I've been working with robots for two years. This year, my favorite part of being on a team was being able to meet new people and learning how to code and work with the robots. Uh, hi, my name is David. I'm 13 years old and I have been working uh, with robots since 2018. And this year, my favorite part of being a part of being on the team was um, constructing the robot. Hello, my name is Corey. I'm 10 years old. I've been working with robots for one and a half years. This year, my favorite part of being on a team was being able to drive and practice using the robots. Hi, my name is Avi Garcia and I'm 13 years old. I've been working with robotics since 2019. This year, my favorite part about being on the team was testing different designs to build the best robot. My name is Victoria, I'm nine years old. I've been working with robots since 2018. My favorite part of being on the team was building the robot and driving it.
the robot is going to move the antenna from the lower part of the network to the upper part of the network? Yes. To transfer? To transfer information. Okay. The robot is going to push the handle forward and then to the side, which is going to drop the file into the hard drive. So the robot has to unlock the padlock and turn the handle from left and then to right to drop the information into the basket and then takes the basket to the base. The robot has to push the handle so it can connect to the port and then get the information from the last one and put it on the magnet. Tell me how you're setting up the program. Okay, so we go to tracing and we do initialize and we click on initialize and we do left the motor port A and right motor port B and then this one has to be like negative 50. And we, yeah, that's how you do initialize. So under A, put uh, one, sorry. Oh wait, no, I think you yeah. do have it right. Yeah, yeah negative one. Yeah. Um, for so for your five grayscale, what ports did you have them in again? On the oh, robot? I had I had one, I had two, and then I had four, six, and seven. Okay. I like that. Okay, that's good. <laughs> I clicked on the wrong program. Just put it down. It's really fast. Stop it. Yikes. Okay, thank you. Oh, it's very strange. I accidentally clicked on the wrong program. Wait. Okay, so switch I mean, your yeah. negative and positive numbers. 40 and one. Mm -hmm. Now it's kind of choppy. I'm going to turn up the speed. Okay. Seven Yes. I need to be over there. Not that many. I guess. Oh my god. Yes. <laughs> okay, so let's figure out why it's moving like that. What speed do you have on your program? 70. No, they're both moving. Okay, they look pretty good. So Probably it's, the surface. It is. Still, see how it runs on the table. Oh, that was perfect. It's the problem with the ground and the ground. Oh, wrong program? Yeah. Oh. That part is to keep going.
I'm Alexandria. Hi, I'm Liz. And this is Art Lab, a place to explore and create with art. Let's go. In this episode of Art Lab, we will be exploring and creating our own color wheel. Today we will be exploring the amazing world of color. Did you know that colors are related? Let's see how. There are three primary colors, yellow, red, and blue. These can be mixed to make the other colors of the rainbow. When you mix yellow and red, you get orange. Red and blue, you get violet, sometimes called purple. Blue and yellow, you get green. These colors are called secondary colors. Using primary and secondary colors alongside black and white can make almost any color in the world. Color wheels are a great way to see the colors and how they are related to each other. Now it's your turn to make your own. Let's get started. First, let's start by finding a nice workspace. It doesn't need to be fancy. All you need is a table and a place to sit. Make sure you're comfy. Next, let's gather our supplies. You'll need a piece of blank paper, a glue stick, scissors, and you need some color for your color wheel. Look through old magazines, junk mail, and scrap paper. You'll also need a template. You can download ours from the description down below, or you can use a round object and a ruler to copy ours. Once you have your supplies, you're ready to go. To start, we need to either print our template, or you can draw yours by tracing anything round you've got around the house. Try a mouse pad or a clock. Look at the template. We have to see how you should label each section. Remember, it doesn't need to be perfect. Once you have your template, let's get to the fun stuff, color. Grab your old magazines or junk mail, and we're gonna start our search. Look for each of our colors in our color wheel, and you might find more than one on each page. Are you having a hard time finding a certain color? We will learn about shades and tints in a different episode, so don't worry if your colors don't match 100%. Variation is good. When you found a color you need, cut it out. Sort your cutouts by color. As you do this, think to yourself, what do you notice about the colors? Are all the greens the same? Even though some of those are different, can we still call them green? What do you notice about the paper? Is it shiny? Is it matte? Do you like the way it feels in your hand? Do you have a favorite color? What does it remind you of? Do you think of a certain taste or smell when you think of that color? Once you have enough color, you can start gluing them down to the correct area of your color wheel. When you begin gluing down your pieces, you'll notice that you may have to cut them to fit in the little pie piece shape on your color wheel. It's kind of like making your own puzzle, except that it's okay if you overlap the pieces. Don't worry if you don't stay within the lines either, unless you want to take that on as a challenge. By gluing small pieces of paper together, we are creating a collage. Collage is a French word that means gluing. When French artists, such as Picasso, began making these collages, they became popular, and the word entered into English as a name for this type of artwork. Once you've glued down your pieces, you're almost done. The last step is to sign your artwork. Be sure to add the date. Let's ooh and ah at what we made. Take a moment and appreciate what you created. Not a single other color wheel is exactly like yours, and that is special. Find a place to keep your color wheel and let it inspire you. So now here's the secret about the color wheel. It's a tool. We can use it to help us make art. See if you want to help identify a color, use the color wheel to help you see where that color lives. If you can't tell, try squinting your eyes and see if that helps you decide. Now that you have some experience with color, why not try to arrange your books or toys by color? Try arranging your dinner plate as a color wheel. How many colors can you eat? If you try this out and want to share, we'd love to see what you come up with. Use the hashtag LBPLArtLab and don't forget to tell us your process. We want to try it as well. That's it for today. If you want to explore more about color, check out the link in the description down below. This has been Art Lab, brought to you by the Long Beach Public Library. See you next time.
the largest crew carried aboard a space shuttle. For two missions, a space shuttle carried eight astronauts on board. STS-61A in 1985 had eight crew members for the entire mission and for the landing of STS-71 in 1995. Wow, South LA Robotics, you impressed me. This was the first time I, I had heard about your program and I absolutely loved hearing the testimonials from the, the the kids that participate in your in your program. I loved how innovative they were with all the different types of robots you had at your facility. I saw a lot of future, you know, well also current, but like <laughs> career roboticists and engineers. Uh, you know, you're definitely training the next generation of engineers and roboticists. And I'd love to connect with some of our STEM education programs because we are also in, in South LA. So love to see if we could uh, collaborate and be innovative together. Um, also, thank you so much, Jen. If, um, if you would like to learn more about the South Los Angeles Robotics team and their organization uh, and all of the competitions that they've, they've been winning, um, please head to www.southlarobotics.com to learn more about them. Um, our next program is, uh, is a children's book author, and her name is Susan Casey. And she is the author of a book called Kids Inventing, and it's a handbook for young inventors. So since today is all about innovation, and uh, invention is a large part of Invent of being innovative as well. This particular book uh, that is that Susan wrote focuses on the stories of young inventors. So, inventors all around, all around um, the U.S. that have created lots of their own inventions, and so it shares some of their stories. It has um, photos and videos of what they've created and how they, they shared it with others. So I, I look forward to seeing all of these kid inventions. I think it's going to be a great time. Hi, I'm Susan Casey. I'm the author of Kids Inventing, a handbook for young inventors. And I'm here today to share stories with you of kid inventors. So welcome to Kids Inventing. What is an invention? Quite simply, it's new, useful, and unobvious. And it's a wide variety of things. It can be a pencil with no moving parts. It can be the light bulb. It could be the telephone. It could be a process of creating a drug to fight cancer. It could be a new kind of salad dressing. And uh, inventions can be a wide range of, uh, of additions to our world. My name is Nini Olowski and I invented the drain wheel. Um, this represents the sink and this could be the drain and this would be enclosed inside and this shows that it's generating energy while we pour. I thought of this idea because um, water always goes down the drain and people are always using it so another way to get something else out of it would be to put, make it generate energy give it another use after it's already been gone to waste. Oh, and also I went to um, dinner with my family and I saw a water wheel and that's how I thought of the idea of how to get the energy out. Yeah, like, um, it doesn't generate a lot of energy, but if you have a high flow it would. Um, so you could put it like to turn on the lights or it could be supplement supplementary to the light you get from the power plant. And when you talk about high flow and low flow, what do you mean? Um, well, if you take a shower, say, then you have a lot of water flowing down, like, for constant rate. Um, so that would be high flow, but let's say you're just, like, washing your hands or brushing your teeth, you only have a little water, so that would be low.
Hi, so how do you become an inventor? Well, everything starts with an idea, and where do you get ideas? They're all around us. And two kids came up with ideas related to bikes. One girl, Krista Moreland, had a problem with her legs, and she uh, invented the water bike so that she could exercise on her bike, but it was in the water. Much easier for her. Mitchell Weiss, a seventh grader, was in the garage at his house trying to put together anything he could find in the garage to invent something, and he spied two things that he put together, his bike and a lawnmower. So he created the bike mower. Those are two unusual ideas, and the kids used STEM skills to create their the inventions out of their ideas. Many people have long waits in the airport and there's nowhere to sit. Renee Steinberg uh, had an idea to solve that problem and take a look. Lots of kids like jumping rope and Wendy Janicek was one of them. But she also liked having only one friend over, not two. So how could you play jump rope? You couldn't. So Wendy got the idea of a different kind of jump rope. And what she did was she took a pole and she put a swivel device on top and attached the rope and then one person could jump and one person could run the uh, jump rope. So she solved her problem. Well, her teacher thought it was a really good idea. So she had the fifth grade students in Wendy's class write letters to companies to see if they would like to make and sell Wendy's jump rope. Well, one of the companies did and it turned out to be sold nationwide. And it turned out that Wendy expanded her idea, too, to create four ropes that would go at a time so four kids could be jumping rope at the same time. So it was a big success, and all the kids were happy. Seventh grader Caitlin Fairweather loved playing lacrosse, and she was on a lacrosse team. So she would practice, but the frustrating thing about practice was that the ball would go flying off and then she'd have to run after it and sometimes she'd lose it, it would get caught in a tree or it would be somewhere she couldn't find it. So she thought, well, I've got to think about this and get a solution. And what she did was came up with no loss lacrosse. That's what she called it. Bader was in the fourth grade, and he was upset because his br a younger brother was disabled, and um, he couldn't walk very well, and his parents had to spend a lot of money caring for him. So he thought, you know, I bet I could come up with something that would help him that was a lot, lot less expensive. And so what he did is he created the walk-along so that as he walked, his brother walked, and he was able to... Uh, help his brother and his family with the walk along. Lisa Wright was upset because her mother left a candle burning and almost burned the house down. So she wanted to create something like a candle that would go off automatically. How did she do that? Well, she started thinking and then she went to her teacher and they talked about it and she came up with the idea of putting wire around the wick and inside the candle. And then when the flame hit the wire, it would go off automatically. So and she had created the auto-off candle. But her name was Lisa Wright, so after some consideration, she decided to rename it the Wright Candle. How do kids protect their inventions? One way is to gain a patent. A patent gives the inventor the right to stop others from using, creating, or selling a product just like theirs. Uh, because they have a patent on it. Eight-year-old Abby Fleck was making bacon in the microwave one, one morning, and uh, a lot of f fat would drip off the bacon, and um, she had to keep stopping the cooking process and sop up some of the fat and stuff, and she thought, this is, uh, you know, I need a better way of doing this. And so she came up with the idea uh, what, of a product she called Macon Bacon, and so basically it was this device, and she basically would string the bacon here, 
here and then the fat would drop in over here. Abby and her father were creating and selling Macon Bacon for years and successfully. And then another company created a similar product and started selling it as well. Because the, um, the Flex had a patent, they were able to then go to court and order that the other company stop making and selling their product. Ever hear of a trademark? It's one way to establish your ownership of a, an invention you create or a product you create. Like So you can think of stores like Target or um, Google, or and they all have those names trademarked. Well, Chris Haas was in the third grade, so he wasn't thinking about that, but he was thinking of his assignment, which was to create a product uh, for the invention fair. And he was, his dad was a basketball coach, and so Chris knew how to shoot a basket. And so he knew other kids didn't, and they didn't know where to hold their hands on the basketball. So Chris put his hands in a, a, some paint and, and put them on the basketball, and the kids would high, high, use it to position their uh, hands in the right place. And Chris didn't win anything at the invention fair, but his dad thought it was a great idea, and they went to sell it. And uh, because of the name, the trademark name, hands-on basketball, it made it easier to sell. And that was decades ago, and Chris's basketball is still selling worldwide. Uh, my name is Chris Haas, and when I was nine years old, I invented the hands-on basketball. And this is what it looks like today, and it's a teaching tool for young kids to learn how to shoot a basketball correctly. And it has handprints for both right and left-handed players. It's got red for right-handed players blue for left-handed players and basically what you do is put your hands on the basketball and you shoot it up and it should make your shot better. Well since creating the basketball I get royalties on every ball that's sold and with the money it's been great. Um, I've been able to put my brother and sister and myself through college. I give back a percentage to children's organizations around the world. Uh, I've had so many people in my own community help me that I just feel it's important to give back community that's meant so much to me. Many kids uh, create inventions using STEM skills and that's what Max Mirahazi did. He created the germ buster and he's going to tell you all about it. Um, my name is Max Mariahazi and this is my invention, the Germ Buster. What it does is kills um, germs on the inside and outside of your hands using ultraviolet lights right here, up on top, and to the right. And um, I uh, participated in, in, in the Astounding Inventions of 2009 and I won a uh, first place division award. These are um, electrostatic brushes which keep the germs inside the germ buster so they don't come out and uh, disinfect your hands so it doesn't like eliminate all of the everything you just did. And how do you know it works? Um, well, we, te we tested by putting a petri dish of um, bacteria on or inside of here, just waited a few seconds and took it out and examined it under a microscope. I have uh, two batteries on each side. I have ultraviolet lights on top, on to the right, and to the left, over here. And I'm using all these alligator clips which attaches the batteries to the um, ultraviolet lights and to the switches right here, here, and uh, down there. Um, well, originally a couple years back, uh, my parents were to, uh, always asking me, did you wash your hands before dinner? And I would always, so eventually that got kind of on my nerves. So I wanted to think of a way that um, uh, would disinfect your hands without uh, as much hassle. And so I've been hearing some uh, rumors of ultraviolet light, so I checked it out and realized that ultraviolet light, the B wave ultraviolet light can disinfect your hands and it can disinfect germs. Ryan Patterson was concerned when he saw some kids having difficulty using sign language to order food at a restaurant. So he thought, maybe I can come up with something that would help them. Well, he got a golf glove and he put a computer on it and he created a screen that would go with it. And then when the kids did their sign language order, it would appear on the screen. Kids are great inventors and they've come up with a wide-ranging uh, solutions to ordinary and extraordinary problems. So put on your thinking cap, think of ideas for inventions, and become the next kid inventor.
Good luck from Kids Inventing. Today we will harness the power of the triangle to make space frames. Hey, welcome to Make Time. My name is Gabriel and I'm with the studio, which is a makerspace that's part of the Long Beach Public Library System. So in this program, Make Time, we're gonna be making projects that you can make from home. Today, we'll be making space frames. So what is a space frame? This is a space frame. A space frame is a three-dimensional structure and it's very strong. It's also composed of triangles. So why triangles? So triangles are very strong shapes. And to demonstrate, I'm gonna compare it with this rectangle. So if I take this rectangle and I push in the sides, you'll notice that it changes in shape. What was once a rectangle is now a rhombus or a diamond. It's not a very strong shape. Now, let's try to do the same thing with this triangle. You'll notice that when I push in the sides that the triangle never loses its shape. That's because the angles are fixed. The rectangle can be deformed because the angles aren't fixed. They can just distort. But the triangle always retains its shape. So, by harnessing the strength of the triangle, space frames can be used to create a wide range of projects, from the architectural to the artistic. Here's an example by famous architect Buckminster Fuller. In this example, him and his team are creating a structure similar to those seen in a playground. If you live in Long Beach like I do, you might recognize this next example. This is the geodesic dome that's next to the Queen Mary. You can even find space frames in, well, space. This is the International Space Station, and it's orbiting around our planet. Pretty cool, huh? So, now that we know what they are, I'm going to show you how you can make your very own space frame. You ready? Let's do this. For today's project, you're gonna need the following materials. You're gonna get some eight and a half by 11 paper. I'm using the scratch paper, a pair of scissors. You're also gonna need some tape. So you can use duct tape, you can use masking tape, or you can use the clear scotch tape. I'm gonna start my project with the scotch tape and then the second part's gonna use this masking tape. And the last thing you're gonna need is a pencil. All right, so now that we have our materials, let's get started. So let's start by making the struts. We're gonna take out our eight and a half by 11 paper and we're gonna begin by folding it in half. I'm just gonna fold it like that and then I'm gonna fold it this way. Make sure you get a nice crease on there and you're going to open up the sheet of paper and you're just gonna cut along the score lines that we created. So I'm gonna get my pair of scissors and let's get started. Let's fast forward this. Okay, so once you're done with that, you should have these four small sheets of paper. And for this project, we actually need six, and I prepared, so I have six of these sheets of paper. So at this point, I'm gonna prepare my tape. So I'm gonna get six pieces of scotch tape to kind of lay it off to the side and they don't have to be big pieces about an inch to two inches and it's going to be one for each strut so now i'm going to get one of these sheets of paper and i'm going to begin by rolling one of the corners so slowly start to roll up and we're going to roll it all the way to that other corner Okay, so once you have this shape, you can take one of your pieces of tape. Cool. So we have one strut. Now we're going to repeat this five more times. For this next one, I'm going to show you another way to do it. So using that pencil, so you can place it on that corner. And you can begin 
rolling it over. And at some point, so your pencil doesn't get stuck, remove the pencil and then continue rolling it. And again, you're gonna get one of your pieces of tape and tape that little corner nice and secure. And let's finish this up. All right, so there we have our six struts. So now we're gonna put three of these aside and with these three that I have in front of me, I'm gonna arrange them into the shape of a, you guessed it, triangle. And this time I'm gonna use my yellow masking tape. I'm gonna cut a piece here and then connect this top part right here. And you can press down, but not so hard that you're gonna flatten the strut. Now at this point, I'm gonna flip it over and I'm gonna secure this by folding it over. Okay, so we have our triangle. Now, I'm gonna prepare the next part by tearing three more pieces of tape and I'm gonna tape it underneath each corner, leaving a little piece out just like that. So now I'm gonna take the last three struts that we made. I'm gonna place them like that and fold the tape over. Make sure that it can go up like that. So you can leave a little bit of room in between these two. Okay. So now that we have our triangle and the three struts on the side, I'm gonna get one more piece of tape and I'm gonna bring in all three and I'm going to tape them together. So there we have it, your very own space frame. So the shape by itself is uh, actually called a tetrahedron. And now at this point, you can make more of these like I did over here, or you can start adding more struts to it and start making more complex shapes. Here's an example. So I took a tetrahedron and then I started adding more struts and it became a polyhedron. And I can continue doing this to make more complex or intricate shapes. It's really cool. So now it's time to get some ideas. We're gonna check in with other folks from the library to see what they made with their space rings. Let's go check it out. Hey everyone, I'm Kevin. I'm a learning guide at the Billie Jean King Main Library. And I used the space frame to make a little homemade bird feeder to put on a ledge. The tetrahedron gives a really nice uh, sturdy structure to hold the two mini triangle bird feeders in place. Hello, this is Chris from the studio and this is my space frame. Hi, this is Jackie here. I made a space frame today and I decided that I could make something to use when I play games with other people. So you know there's sometimes those weird shaped die dice that have different numbers of sides. Well, I made a four-sided die. So I used the triangle, get out of the sunshine there, this the triangle space frame that we made. And then I traced it and cut out triangles and taped them on. My tape wasn't very good, sorry about that. And I put one, two, three, four on each of the sides. So if we're trying to figure out who goes first, second, third, fourth in a game, or if we're playing another kind of game where you have to roll a die, you can use that for your game now. And it's more fun than a little tiny one. Hello everyone, my name's Artie and I made a space frame. What am I gonna do with my space frame? Well, it holds these brushes pretty well. Maybe I'll use it to hold my foam brushes. What are you gonna do with your space frame? Sky's the limit, or maybe space. Cool, thanks for sharing everyone. So there you have some great ideas of what other people have made using space frames. So now it's your turn to create your own ideas. It's time to make. So that's it for today. Thank you for making time to watch Make Time. 
and look out for our other videos with more creative projects that you can make from home. See ya! The Saturn V is the largest rocket that's ever been flown, so it required quite a bit of fuel to lift the Apollo missions to the moon. Now, if we could measure the amount of fuel per second used by the Saturn V in the weight of elephants, how many elephants per second of fuel did the Saturn V have to burn? The Saturn V's first stage would burn approximately four elephants worth of fuel per second. That's just a bit of mass being thrown out the back. Wow, it was amazing to hear some of these testimonials from the kids themselves and what inventions they created. I had no idea that things like the, the germ <laughs> buster or the make and bacon uh, walk along, all of those examples uh, were made by kids. And I mean, how to navigate the patent process alone. <laughs> that is wonderful. And I love that um, Susan Casey shared all of those examples. Um, thank you so much, Susan, for that great presentation on these young inventors and their inventions. Um, next up, we're going to be hearing from Dr. Danielle Jenkins, and she is from an organization called We STEM Los Angeles, or Women in STEM. And this program is all is about supporting women in STEM at all levels, both at the the K twelve level, the university student level, um, beyond that as well. You know, graduate degrees, and then also women that are currently either in the community or in industry and in academia. Um, it's hosted through the the mayor's office, and they have a ton of they've had amazing programming for this last month. Um, I've attended a few of them myself. They had a, a women in tech panel with a bunch of both professional and academic leaders that talked about being a woman in tech. And um, let's see. And then they also uh, most recently this week actually had a negotiation, like how to negotiate for you know your pay and your benefits uh, in terms of women in STEM. Um, and how to go about doing that and what you should know and how to advocate for yourself in lots of different settings like that. So I am personally very looking forward to seeing what Dr. Danielle Jenkins has to say about um, all of the things that We STEM is currently doing in Los Angeles and supporting women in STEM um, and seeing also about opportunities for everyone watching to also get involved with the program. City of STEM. Hi, I'm Dr. Danielle Jenkins, Strategic Program Director for We STEM LA. It is such an honor to be here today and, partic and participate in the City of STEM. Los Angeles is the home to one of the fastest growing and most dynamic tech in engineering sectors. In September 2018, Mayor Eric Garcetti's office launched We STEM LA in partnership with the Mayor's Fund Los Angeles to ensure that women are equitably included in the promising industries. This initiative aims to build a network of support that will encourage women not just to stay in the industry, but also to make sure they build a strong network. We have several program elements. We help with uh, youth educational programs, college to professional mentorship programs, and professional development. Just some of the impact that we've had since 2018, uh, we have collaborated with numerous community partners to provide STEM training in science, coding, and robotics to LAUSD students. We have provided scholarships 
to first year college students pursuing STEM related degrees. And 150 college students and professionals have participated in our mentoring program. We have hosted career development networking events for hundreds of professional women in STEM. And we wanna continue the work that we do. We are here to support the women in science, technology, engineering, and math in Los Angeles. This year, we STEM LA decided to do something uh, different due to COVID-19. We know that the community, the STEM workforce has been impacted. So we wanted to make sure that we are here for our uh, community. And so we have launched the We STEM LA survey. Now the We STEM LA survey, uh, actually, if we could just put that in a link, we are gonna ask those of you who are um, here today to take the survey. It shouldn't take long. It's a three minute survey. And we want to make sure that we get people in the workforce to take the survey so we can make sure that we are creating effective programs. So it's in the chat. So we do welcome allies to also take the survey. And we want you to also share the survey with your network. So we have recently uh, developed our survey and we have started to get uh, basically some data already. So I just wanna go over a few uh, data points for you. 145 individuals in STEM careers have taken the survey so far. 27% are male. 80.7% are female and 0.69, they prefer not to disclose, but we need more individuals, including men to take the survey. Please share this with your network. A little bit more about our results, just over half of the survey participants work or study in science. The STEM disciplines of work of study are as followed. 52.4% are science in science, 26.7 are in technology, 13.1 are in engineering, 7.85 are in mathematics. All age groups have been represented in the survey results thus far, with most participants being 25 to 54 years old. However, individuals ages 18 to 24, 55 to 64, and 65 to 74 have completed the survey. Over 50% of the survey participants either strongly agree or somewhat strongly agree to the following statements. I feel uncertain, uncertainty or anxiety about my career prospects due to COVID-19 and the pandemic. So please stay tuned for the remaining results of our COVID-19 study, and please share it with your network. And uh, we just wanna make sure again, that we are being effective to our uh, community, the people that work in science, technology, and engineering and math. And we also will have more details about how COVID-19 has also impacted employment, education, health, caregiving responsibilities, and also health. So as I mentioned before, WeSTEM is doing a lot in the community. I wanted to share uh, some upcoming events that we will be having. Uh, one of those events, we have a career development uh, workshop series. We just had a workshop uh, last night and it was women in STEM and negotiation. And so we're gonna have more of those uh, workshops to help our women, professional women and students as they navigate their careers in STEM. Another thing we'll be doing this year is uh, relaunching the mentoring program. And we're gonna do it a little different this year. We're gonna have a, co a cohort model where we're gonna have our uh, college students university students apply for the program and then they will be matched up with a professional mentor. And we have a couple more events that we are gonna be doing this year. So please also stay tuned for that. 
Uh, we're going to have a um, women in aerospace uh, panel. Uh, we're going to have a women uh, in entertainment and tech panel. And we also are going to partner with uh, one of our corporate partners to do an innovation collaboration uh, for uh, women in STEM and uh, entertainment as well. So right now, I want to find out if there's any questions for you. And before I take the question, I just wanted to let you know how you can get involved with We STEM LA. So if you look at the slide, please visit our website at www.lamayor.org slash we stem dot LA. Uh, and then email us at www lamayors.org, we stem LA, and you can also uh, connect with me also on LinkedIn. So are there any questions from the audience? Okay, so I do see a question. Someone asked, uh, so what geographical location do we serve? So we currently serve the greater Los Angeles area. Uh, we, especially with the schools and universities, we, we serve, uh, we're connected with USC, UCLA, Pepperdine, Loyola Marymount, the CSUs, and also the community colleges. Uh, someone else asked, uh, how, again, how can you get involved? You know, please uh, just go to our website and you could also, uh, for more information, contact us and we will definitely send you more information, whether you want to be uh, mentored or you just want to participate in some of our programs. Uh, someone asked, uh, what about internships and jobs? Uh, we have been contacted by several of our community partners and corporate partners about opportunities. So we do share those opportunities with our network as well. Okay, someone else asked about a uh, mentorship program. So yes, we're gonna relaunch that program and it's gonna be in a cohort model where we would have uh, our applicants apply. And then once they're, uh, whoever's accepted into the program, they would be matched up with a mentor, a professional woman uh, in the industry. Any more questions? Yeah, I'm good. Okay. Well, thank you so much, everyone, for uh, it was so great to, to sit here and talk to you about what is going on in the city for Weston LA. Thank you for being a part of the, the city, of, uh, city of STEM. And I will see you uh, soon. Thank you very much. Wow. I thank you so much, Dr. Danielle Jenkins, of, for telling us all about We STEM and how to get involved as either a mentor or participating in all of the ways that they support women in STEM, especially in the Los Angeles area. Um, so next up, we have um, LA County Public Works is going to be talking about um, some of the civil engineering things that they are doing in their location. And um, so if you've ever, have you ever wondered what happens to rain once it falls uh, onto our streets and to our, on, onto earth? Well, today we're going to be joined live with uh, Mackenzie uh, Doman and uh, Tuan Nugan, uh, who are civil engineers with LA County Public Works. And they're gonna talk about 
um, watersheds and the journey of water from the sky to the oceans and the importance of actually capturing and treating rainwater uh, to create healthier and safer communities in Los Angeles. In this episode of Make Time, we will be printmaking with shaving cream to create marbled art. Hello and welcome to Make Time. My name is Courtney and I'm a studio guide at the Makerspace in the Long Beach Public Library. In this Print Make Time mini-series, we will be learning a variety of printmaking projects that you can make at home. Today, we will be making shaving cream marble prints. Marble printmaking results in a mono print. Mono, meaning one, means each unique print can only be made once. This is unlike most printmaking processes where you are able to create many copies of the same image. Marble printmaking originated in ancient Japan. Called suminagashi, or ink floating, this technique has been around since the 12th century and has since spread around the globe. Different methods have developed, as well as techniques to print on fabric, wood, and even inside of books. Did you know that the Billie Jean King Library has a collection of marble printed books? The permanent collection in the Miller Room has all sorts of artifacts that can be viewed during open hours including some amazing marbled books. Inspired by this ancient technique, we will be using shaving cream to float color to create our very own marble prints. For today's project, you are going to need the following materials. Plain white foam shaving cream, food coloring, a long and thin mixing stick, This can be anything you can hold on to to mix and marble your color. A shallow tray or pan slightly larger than your paper. Paper cut to size that fits inside the tray. Cardstock is best because it's smooth and slightly thicker than printer paper, but printer paper or construction paper will work fine. A scraper tool. To remove the excess foam from your print, this can be a cut strip of cardboard or a popsicle stick. And finally, some paper towels, because we're going to get a little messy. If you don't have food coloring at home, you can try to experiment with other color pigments. If you have ink or watercolor, acrylic or tempera paint, try mixing a small amount to some water to create a liquid mixture in a shallow cup or palette. You can see here that I am mixing tube watercolor with water to make liquid watercolor. Apply this colored liquid mix using a dropper or a paintbrush. Ready to get printmaking? First, compare the paper you will be printing on to the size of the tray. Cut down your paper if needed. Try a few different sizes to experiment with. Next, spray a small amount of shaving cream into the tray. The foam will expand, so a little goes a long way. Use your hand to spread the foam around to create an even layer slightly larger than the paper you will be using. We are now ready to add color. Choose your first color to drip onto the shaving cream. Add a second and maybe even a third color to create many drops of color onto the surface of the shaving cream. Next comes the marbling part. Take your mixing stick and swirl along the surface of the foam to mix and marble the colors together. Swirl a pattern of lines and zigzags. Use waves and loops to stretch the drops of color. Try to cover the surface with swirls of mixing color. When you are ready, it's time to make your first print. Lay your paper onto the foam and use your hand to press the paper firmly into the surface of the foam. Be gentle and be sure to get the corners. You might see the color absorbing into your paper already. Now, lift the paper starting at the corner and flip over to lay flat on the table surface dry side down. If there is extra foam on your marble print, use your scraper to scrape the foam off your paper and back into the tray. Sometimes your scraper might drag the color on your paper as well, 
That's okay. It's all a part of the process. Check out our first marbled print. Awesome! Is there something you think you can improve on? Remember, with printmaking, we are able to make many prints. We will be able to experiment and continue printing as many as we want. You will improve and control the outcome better with every print made. Before we continue with another print, I want to take a moment and talk about color. In this form of printmaking, we are relying on the way our colors will mix and swirl together. Remember that planning your colors ahead of time can help with the outcome of your prints as you experiment. Let's take a look at this color wheel. First, let's start with the primary colors, red, yellow, blue. These colors mix together to make all the other colors in our color wheel. Red and yellow make orange, yellow and blue make green, blue and red make purple. Colors that are next to each other mix together nicely, such as blue, green, and yellow, or blue, purple, and red, while colors that are across the color wheel from each other don't mix so nice. Let's see what happens when we mix red and green together. Colors that are across from each other on the color wheel are called complementary colors. They look vibrant when they are next to each other in a picture, but when mixed together, the colors cancel each other out and turn a brownish gray color which is fine if you're trying to mix brown or gray. But in this project, we want our colors to pop. Let's get back to our shaving cream to repeat the marble printmaking process. Take a look at the colors you already have in your tray. Determine if you should add different colors or more of the same. Maybe you want to try a new swirling pattern. Remember the steps? Add color, mix in marble, then print. You can add more shaving cream to create a new surface for another print but you won't need to until you've made a few more prints. With printmaking, we are able to create multiple prints using the same process over and over again. While you continue to make more prints, try experimenting with different materials and techniques. Use a fork or a comb as a mixing stick to create many parallel lines. Try using different paper. Maybe try using a drawing, a poster, or a page from an old book. What happens when you try to make two prints from the same color mix, or reprint a marbled print a second time? Here, I am using old math homework I cut into smaller squares so I can make a bunch of marble prints. When you're done, make sure to clean up your workspace and allow your prints to dry fully. Now that you have a collection of marble prints, what are some ways you can use the marble printed paper to make something else? Check out our other Make Time videos for some inspiration on how you can use your marble printed paper with kirigami, bullet journaling, and book binding right here on the Long Beach Public Library YouTube channel. Let's check in with some of our other studio guides and see their prints. Thanks for sharing, everyone. Way to use what you had on hand to create beautiful prints. Hopefully you are feeling inspired from all of these awesome examples. Now it's your turn. It's time to print and to make. To make. Thank you for making time to watch Print Make Time. If you are interested in learning more about printmaking, check out the link in the description box below. There you will find a selection of printmaking books available at the Long Beach Public Library. Be sure to check out the rest of our Make Time videos with even more creative projects you can create from home. See you next time! Hi everyone, thank you so much for having us today. My name is Mackenzie Doman and I'm here today with Tuan Nguyen and we're going to be giving our presentation, Clean, Capture, Create, Stormwater Projects of the Future. So just a little bit about myself. I'm an Associate Civil Engineer for Los Angeles County Public Works. I've worked for the county for over five years now. 
I got my bachelor's degree in civil engineering with an emphasis in environmental engineering from Loyola Marymount University. And I recently completed my master's in public administration from California State University, Northridge. I'm originally from Portland, Oregon, and some of my interests slash hobbies include hiking, camping, traveling, which unfortunately has taken a bit of a pause during the current state of things, and playing with my two adorable cats, Hemi and Cleo, which you can see on the bottom right. So hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Tuan Nguyen, and I'm happy to be sharing my experiences with you all today. I am currently a civil engineer for the Los Angeles County of Public Works. I received both my bachelor's and master's degrees from UC Irvine, where the school mascot is an anteater. Um, I'm originally from Vietnam, but for the majority of my life, I've grown up in Los Angeles. I enjoy playing all sorts of sports, and I'm definitely a big Lakers and Dodgers fan. I recently got into gardening to help me get out of the house more and stay active. And lastly, I really enjoy biking uh, with my family, especially um, with my two sons. And we would like, we, we bike around different college campuses. Nice, so Tuan and I are both civil engineers and there were some clues that we might, that this might be a good career, for, career path for us from a young age. So personally, I really enjoyed the math classes I took and the science classes especially the really fun labs that we had during chemistry and physics. And then I also really loved building or pl playing with Legos. So building structures and towns and just putting the pieces together and creating something from just the little tiny blocks. So yeah, for as myself, um, in my group of friends, I tend to be the, the planner. Um, I would plan to, I would plan get together events, vacations or road trips, or even as simple as where to meet for lunch. Um, being a planner helped me be organized, uh, develop my communication skills, um, learn to assign tasks and anticipate problems, and then coming up with solutions. So um, what is theme? Um, I'm sure you've been hearing and learning a lot about this word throughout this event. But for those who haven't heard the word yet, uh, STEAM stands for science, technology, engineering, arts, and mathematics. Um, in particular, this presentation, Mackenzie and I will be talking about engineering, which is the E in STEAM. So as you can see on the list here, there are many types of engineering, ranging from chemical to civil engineering, where you can help design and build roads, bridges, dams, and buildings. As we go down the list, there's also environmental engineering, where you can help improve and maintain the environment. Um, to definitely protect the human health and protect nature for everyone to enjoy. Um, there's also software engineering where you can create and develop computer programs, apps for cell phones and video games. And then lastly, with aerospace engineering, you can help build airplanes and aircrafts. So civil engineering to me is, is fun in that I get to work with a team to plan a project, design it, and then get the project constructed. Our team would, then, would identify a problem, come up with possible solutions, and then putting those solutions into actions. Um, so in particular today, Mackenzie and I will be sharing with you all on why we need to make sure our rainwater stays clean after it rains and what happens if it doesn't. We'll also be showing you a really cool project we worked on and what it took us um, for us to get that project constructed. So I, I really like this picture because it gives a glimpse into what civil engineering is. Um, this picture shows you two structures that are separated on the left and the right side. And then you have a bridge that it is then co uh, constructed to, to connect them. The bridge is, is designed and constructed to be functional and most importantly, safe um, for people like you and me to be able to go back and forth between the two structures. So as for myself, I personally have worked for LA County Public Works for over 13 years now, um, where it is our mission to deliver regional infrastructure and services to improve the quality of life for more than 10 million people in the Los Angeles County. Um, we are able to achieve this through always thinking safety first, knowing and understanding our community needs and priorities. And we treat each other with respect, fairness, and understanding. And we also 
um, like to share ideas and we promote a culture of transparency. Uh, we encourage inclusivity and building a culture of innovation and new ideas. So what does public works do? Um, at public works, uh, we provide services that are broken into six core service areas. Um, I'll water, so the first one is water resources, environmental uh, services, transportation, public buildings, development services, and emergency management. Um, so I'll give you guys an idea of what some of these services are. Uh, first, in water resources, we make sure LA County's water resources are safe, uh, they're clean, and it's reliable for everybody. And in environmental services, Public Works provides trash collection for over 1 million residents and 20,000 businesses. Um, in transportation, Public Works managers and manages and maintains a vast uh, network of roads, sidewalks, bridges, and bicycle facilities, and airports within the unincorporated areas of the county. And lastly, it, in emergency management, Public Works prepares and responds to daily incidents and also major emergencies and disasters such as earthquakes, um, fires, and also flooding. So as a civil engineer, um, you can work in any of these core service areas. And for myself, I currently work in the water resource core service area. Okay, thank you, Tuan. So now I'm going to dive a little bit deeper into what Tuan and I both do, and I'm gonna start with why we do it. So I want everyone to take a few seconds and think about what happens when it rains. So some of you might be thinking that it's time to get out the umbrellas to keep ourselves dry. Or maybe you think that we need to start putting on a lot of layers because it's gonna be really cold. Or maybe you really enjoy jumping in puddles after it rains. Or maybe you just get really bummed because you're stuck inside with all the rainy weather. So we all experience some of these things when it rains, but have you ever thought about what happens on a larger scale? Have you ever heard of the term watershed? So a watershed is an area of land where water collects and drains into a specific river, ocean, lake, or other body of water. So here in LA, we have mountains that surround us and create what is called a watershed boundary. And all the water within that watershed boundary flows into our rivers, like the LA River, and then out into the ocean. So on a smaller scale, when it rains in our cities, the rain hits the pavement, goes into the big holes in our sidewalks, which we call catch basins. And then from there, from the catch basins, it goes into an underground network of pipes called the storm drain. And then from the storm drain, it leads out to our rivers and ultimately out into the ocean. So unfortunately, as the water runs down our streets, before reaching the catch basin, it picks up pollutants, which include metals, which could come from brake pads, trash, which could come from people littering or overflowing trash cans, chemicals such as herbicides that people put in their gardens, and bacteria, which could come from people not picking up after their dogs. So why is it important to keep rainwater clean after it rains? Because if you don't, if we don't keep the rainwater clean, it will affect our water quality in the rivers and oceans where the sea animals live. It can also affect the land animals and wildlife like birds. And then it also can affect recreational places like the beach, where if the water is dirty or polluted, we can't play or swim in it. And lastly, it can increase the toxicity in our water where it will make all the animals, including ourselves, very sick. So now that we know the problem and the challenge of keeping the rainwater clean, um, how do we solve it? So one way to solve this problem is to capture all that dirty water after it rains and find an area with plenty of space um, to construct a big concrete box underground. We call this galleries um, or construct concrete cylinders um, that act like a well to put that water um, to put that water in so we can treat it. Fortunately for us, uh, we were able to find such a location at a LA County Park. This particular one is Franklin D. Roosevelt Park. And as you can see from the pictures, there's plenty of open space, mainly in the soccer field. So once we have determined a location, 
our team would then proceed with the three phases of a project. Uh, one is, first is planning, second is design, and third is construction. So the first phase uh, is planning. So in the planning phase, um, our team hosts, hosted multiple community meetings um, to inform the residents about the Roosevelt Park project we're working on and also get their input on things they would like to see added to the project. I know these pictures show a lot of adults at the community meetings, but if you look closely at the picture on the left, um, you'll see a young people like yourselves participating as well. Therefore, I encourage all of you to attend community meetings whenever, whenever you get a chance and to learn about what is going on in your community and to provide input. So from these community meetings, uh, we receive input from residents wanting an upgraded artificial um, turf soccer field with lights uh, to be able to play soccer all year round and also at night as well, a play area for their children and repair of an old existing skate park located next to the project. So what we did with the input is our project team then took the residents input and came up with ways to incorporate them into the project. This way, the project would not only help improve our water quality, but at the same time, improve the park for the residents to enjoy. Like Mackenzie showed earlier, um, when it rains, the water flows into catch basin, then the storm drains. So from the picture on the top, as part of this project, we would construct storm drains. Uh, or pipes uh, shown in the blue lines to collect that rainwater and direct it towards the park uh, to the concrete galleries shown in the blue boxes. Um, we were then able to determine that the concrete galleries would be able to be constructed underneath the soccer field and next to the skate park. Also, we were able to determine the concrete cylinders. Uh, we call them dry wells in, in, uh, in engineering term and shown here in the blue circles, um, located in the street to help capture additional rainwater when it rains. While the rainwater flows through the storm drains and before going to the galleries and dry wells, it goes through a pretreatment unit where trash, debris, and pollutants are removed so the clean water can flow onwards and to soak into the ground. So as you can see, the two renderings were developed to show that the project, what the project might look like after it has been constructed. So here are more renderings we developed to show the residents how their input would be incorporated into this project. The picture on the left shows a new and improved artificial turf soccer field, while the bottom right um, picture shows a new playground area for kids to enjoy. We also added an educational garden um, for residents to discover new plants and learn about drought tolerant landscaping. Okay, thank you, Tuan. So after the planning phase, we move into the design phase. And the design phase is probably what most people think about when they think about engineering. This is when we have our designers use programs to draw out the plans, uh, which look like these here on the screen, and these will eventually be used for construction. And this is also a time that we do a lot of coordination to make sure that we have the correct permits to protect the environment and also permission to do the work. And also so that we aren't impacting any existing items that are in the project area. And then the third phase, which is my personal favorite, construction. Um, this is where we get to see all the hard work we did come to life. So here are some photos from our construction site at Roosevelt Park. Uh, the photo on the left shows our walking path being installed. The photos on the right are of the underground infiltration galleries. And then the remaining photos are some additional elements. And then on this slide, these are some of the photos of the dry well drilling. So the equipment used to do this work, they're huge. Um, I remember going out to the site and it was so incredible to see. Um, you can tell that how big they are based on the people standing next to the equipment. You can see there in the photo. Um, these drill rigs, they dug over 75 feet into the ground and they were five feet in diameter. So these were really, really large holes that we were drilling into the ground. Um, and in the bottom left, you can see the pipe. Um, that is the dry well pipe that we were installing. Um, so it was a really, really fun experience going out to the site to see uh, this construction in action. And then I have a quick time-lapse video here. 
Um, this is showing the infiltration galleries being installed. Um, we had a lot of rain delays, as you can see. And then you can see the excavation. And then after it was excavated, you can see they're preparing it for installing the dry well. They're about to pour the concrete. Um, they left little holes in the concrete to allow, or about two foot holes to allow for the water to soak in. That's installing the uh, gallery units. And they did it one half at a time. So you can see this, they're repeating the same process on the second half. They poured the concrete and then they installed the units and then they cover it right back up. So it's pretty amazing um, that that large structure is under the ground there. So lastly, here is the final product. Um, as you can see, we have a beautiful soccer field and the gallery is right underneath there. We also included some educational signage so that people can learn about the stormwater capture system that's at their park, because without that educational signage, people probably wouldn't have any idea. Uh, we also included drought tolerant landscaping and exercise equipment, as well as a play area with the play mounds that Tuan had mentioned earlier. So these are just some photos that show um, the final product. So why become a civil engineer? Um, if you ever wondered whether you should become a civil engineer, I want you to ask um, yourself, um, do you like making a difference in your community? Do you enjoy being part of a team uh, to solve problems? Um, being a civil engineer, you can use your creativity and at the same time, learn new things. If your answer to any of the questions I just asked was a yes, then I, I definitely encourage you and I definitely, um, you should definitely think about becoming a civil engineer. So Mackenzie and I would uh, like to thank you guys uh, for giving us the opportunity to share our work with you guys today and hope you found it useful. Um, we can answer any questions if we have some time left. Yeah, okay. So I think we have a little bit of time to answer questions. Um, the first question we got was, what are some ways we can clean the water if it does get polluted? Do you want to take that, Tuan? Yeah, so some of the things you can do at home, actually, is or in your everyday life, is um, don't litter. Uh, make sure you appropriately throw your trash away in a, a trash bin. Um, definitely recycle. And if you have pets, you know, if you're walking them out, out and about in your neighborhood, in the park, or anywhere, uh, make sure to pick up after your pets. Um, so those are some things that you can definitely do. Uh, but if the water is polluted, um, you know, we do have projects in there and we have programs. We, we have clean beach cleanup days, um, trash pickup days. Um, but definitely those are some of the things you can do um, right off the bat at home. Yeah, and I would say to add to that, you can also look on the county website. There are some resources how you could potentially update your landscaping in your yard to capture some storm water. Um, so when it runs off your yard, if it's picking up pollutants, then um, it could be treated before it either infiltrates into the ground or runs off into the street. So that's another way that you could treat polluted water at your house. Um, another question, does water that flows into the storm drain make its way into our water supply? So I can start with this one. So this, when it goes into the storm drain, it actually makes its way out into the ocean. So it goes into the storm drain, then out into usually a river, and then it goes out into the ocean. So we don't use the ocean for water supply. Um, however, with these projects that we are installing, um, we're diverting the water either into the ground. We also have some projects diverting into um, sewer, which could potentially be used for reuse. Um, so the projects that we're putting in are increasing our water supply. Do you have anything to add to that, Tuan? No, that was perfectly put, Mackenzie. Okay, thank you. Then do it's 540. Do we have time for more questions? City of STEM? Okay. Perfect. Thank you. So the next question is how long does it take from the design to construction phase? Do you want to start off? Tom? Yeah, I can take that one. Um, so usually for us, in our experience uh, with the Roosevelt Park, uh, it took about five to six years, uh, starting from planning. Um, it started back, I think, 2015, uh, part of the planning process, again, meeting with the communities, the residents to get their input, 
And then as we go through the design process, um, that took a, uh, a year, year and a half. And then through construction, that took about a year, another year, year and a half. So total, in total, we, in our experience, we're looking at five to seven years uh, for these type of big, what we call regional stormwater capture projects um, to be able to go from start at the planning all the way to end of construction. So about five to seven years. Thank you, Tuan. And then the last question we have is, do you two know what the biggest consumer of water is here in LA? Do you know the answer to that, Tuan? Oh, that's a good question. You know, I, I don't know. That's a good question. Yeah. My guess would be some form of like landscaping. Um, a lot of water is utilized um, to water grass um, and different landscapings. So that would be my guess, but I, I don't know the official answer, but I do know that is a big consumer. Yeah. So that's also another reason to use the drought tolerant landscaping that we put into the Roosevelt project. And you can also put those into your own personal yards. Yeah. So I hope we answered all your questions and it was really great being here. Yeah, so thank you for having us. All right, thank you everybody. City of Stam. Go long! What spacecraft is the furthest away from the Earth? Voyager 1 is playing the long game and has traversed the furthest distance at just under 14 billion miles away from us. I feel so much more informed about not only the, the LA watershed, but how, you know, civil engineering plays such a key role in not only like all of the science and applications of science, but also in keeping our community safe from all of that storm water. Um, next up, or sorry, uh, thank you, Mackenzie and Tuan. I'm glad to hear that there's such, uh, so many positive changes that are being, uh, worked towards in Los Angeles County. And next up, we have a program called USC Sea Grant. And USC Sea Grant is a program that not only integrates and funds research, but also covers educational education and outreach. Uh, and the main focus of a lot of what they um, they discuss, research, and educate about is the urban ocean. Uh, they usually do fund uh, marine research and communicate that research to policy leaders to make, you know, systemic changes. And they do a ton of outreach to K through 12 uh, students and their teachers to increase ocean and science literacy. And I know that because I have one of a dear mentor, colleague, and friend that runs their their a lot of their ocean education programs named Linda Chilton. So if she's watching, hi. Um, but particularly for this uh, upcoming segment, we are going to meet uh, the lovely Roxana Pakar, um, and she is going to tell us all about the process it took in developing a socially assistive robot. Um, and I'm really looking forward to hearing more about her engineering journey. My name is Maria and I work for USC Sea Grant and I'm here with Roxana, a recent USC graduate who will share her story with us and her involvement with engineering and how they're solving real world problems. Hi Roxana, thank you for joining me. Thanks so much for having me. As a child, what were some of your interests? Yeah, um, so as a child, uh, I was really interested in art and I and reading and history, so things that you might not necessarily think would lead to engineering. Um, but I was also really into, you know, I think part of art and being creative is, you know, design and design is a huge part of engineering. So I think, I think even if you think that your interests aren't necessarily math and science, like 
from an early age, uh, you could still go on a path that will lead you to engineering, which is really just problem solving and being creative. Okay. Can you tell me a little bit how uh, did you end up choosing USC in your field of study? Yeah, uh, so growing up in LA, I always knew about USC, but I didn't really know about what USC and specific engineering school offered until I did this summer program, summer before my senior year of high school, uh, called Mission Engineering at USC, where we explored the different engineering disciplines. So we did a project related to electrical engineering, mechanical engineering, chemical engineering, um, and civil engineering. And this kind of uh, gave me a better idea of what even what engineering is and what engineers at USC specifically do. Um, so that kind of uh, helped me decide that I wanted to do engineering because I really enjoy doing these like hands on projects where we got to, you know, build a circuit, design, you know, design a structure, um, that sort of thing. And then I also I did uh, robotics in high school. Um, which was really was really fun. And also, you know, kind of gave me an idea of hey, this thing that I enjoy doing could also potentially be my career where I get to, you know, build and design cool things. But then these cool things could also have, you know, real world applications. Um, in your own words, what does it mean to be an innovator? I think an innovator is someone who is not afraid to, you know, be bold, express ideas that they have, even if they might seem a bit outlandish and crazy, because you know, these like big ideas are what can be narrowed down to real solutions to problems. And I think, I think anyone can be an innovator. I think it's just a, a matter of, you know, getting creative, working with other people and not being afraid to pitch ideas and put yourself out there. Awesome. Uh, you joined uh, USC's Interaction Lab during your freshman year. Can you tell us a little about what the lab does and your experience? Yeah, so the Interaction Lab is led by uh, Dr. Maya Matarik, who is a pioneer and an innovator in the field of socially assistive robotics and human robot interaction. Socially assistive robotics are robots that can assist people with um, you know, things in their day to day lives, such as in healthcare capacities like robots uh, in like hospital settings, robots in the home, robots. Um, in schools, uh, just any way that you can think of that a robot can um, help you if in doing something um, is part of socially assistive robotics. And Dr. Matarik, uh, you know, kind of created, she created this field. And uh, when I, I joined the lab, so the lab does many different projects in many different capacities, whether in education or um, helping, you know, children with developmental issues. We they tackle all sorts of uh, issues that technology and robotics can be used to address these problems. Um, and uh, when I joined my freshman year, I was working on a project where we uh, designed robots to help kids with autism improve their social interaction. Because um, a lot of times children on the autism spectrum have varying levels of uh, issues talking to, engaging with, relating to their peers and other people. And so these robots served as a bridge uh, to help them learn how to uh, express themselves socially and um, be able to interact eventually with their peers. Uh, and so I started uh, just building these robots when I first joined the lab, um, you know, just working on like, you know, wiring, uh, soldering, you know, like physically making the hardware inside of the robot. And that eventually led to being more involved in the studies and deploying or putting robots into homes um, and studying how children react to them, how they form relationships with them, um, and what positive outcomes that has for them. Um, so working with socially assistive robotics is one application of electrical engineering. Can you share a little bit more about your specific project called Marlink? Yeah, uh, so I'm, I've always been really interested in our oceans uh, growing up in LA, you know, the beaches were a big part of my life. And uh, and I kind of wanted to do some sort of uh, application of engineering that would, you know, help us understand our oceans a little bit better. And so 
I realized that a huge problem in knowing more about the oceans is it's really difficult to communicate underwater. You can't use like our normal methods of communication, like radio waves, they don't work as well underwater. They don't travel as far. Um, and so with a few of my good friends, we kind of started brainstorming, how do we address this problem? How do we enable scientists and researchers to be able to communicate underwater, to be able to have robots that can travel, you know, um, autonomous underwater vehicles, uh, which are uh, unmanned submarines, essentially, like go underwater and learn more and be able to communicate in real time to scientists, you know, who can't go that far underwater. Uh, and so as we brainstormed this, we came up with Marlink, which is um, utilizes multiple types of communication. So not just, you know, the normal radio waves that we use on land, but uses uh, laser diodes and um, as on top of the radio waves and acoustic communication to kind of expand the reach of how far underwater robots can go and learn and see and then tr uh, transmit that information back to us on the land. Okay. Science is how we understand our world. Mentors are how you get to the place you want to be and how you become the person that you want to be. Oh, curious, determined, uh, diligent. Okay, I mean, this might be the same for most people, but definitely my cell phone. I mean, that's, you know, my calendar is on there. That's how I communicate with my friends. That's how I look up random things that I'm interested in learning about, um, you know, how I, uh, you know, play different games on my phone or go on social media. I mean, it's like my, like, bridge to everything in the world for the most part, besides, you know, actually going outside. So, so yeah, definitely my phone. If I had a superpower, I would definitely want to teleport because you know, being from LA, it takes so long to get places sometimes in traffic. And I'm someone who like, I tend to be late to things. Some, I, you know, hard for me to admit that, but I can be late to things. So it would be nice to be able to get to all the places that I want to go and um, also places that are far away and see cool things that you don't necessarily have the time to do or don't want to, um, you know, go on a really long trip to do, you know, as someone who is really busy. So yeah, definitely teleporting. Now, thinking about all our viewers today, what advice would you give them in, if they are interested in a career in engineering or in any STEM field? Um, I would say that first off, you know, in your own schools nowadays, I'm sure there are hopefully plenty of resources to help you, whether that be a math teacher, a physics teacher, a chemistry teacher. Um, I say, you know, reach out to them, tell them that you have these interests. If you know, you're lucky and your school has a robotics team, I would highly encourage you to join. Uh, it may not seem like the coolest thing to do, but uh, it is that that's kind of where I, you know, got my start really like getting hands on and building things. And, you know, it's kind of this immediate gratification where you build a robot and then you can drive it around. And that's just such a good feeling. Um, so I would recommend first off looking at your schools and seeing what they offer you. And um, you know, then looking outside of your schools, you know, seeking, there are tons of programs out there that teach coding or robotics and whatnot, or different universities in your area might have summer programs. So I would encourage you to apply to those. Um, and then also there's just tons of free online resources nowadays, videos on YouTube, um, just like projects you can do at home. Uh, so yeah, I think if you have any inkling or interest, I would just see what I would go online, I would talk to someone at your school, see what's available to you. And then, you know, just try not to get discouraged. A lot of times um, things in engineering and STEM take trial and error and it can be discouraging sometimes, but it's really just about like, you know, knowing what problem it is that you want to solve or what goal you have for yourself and um, persevering to get to that. What are you working on now? Um, you know, whether are you in school or you're working, share a little bit about that. 
Yeah, so after graduating, I started working at the Aerospace Corporation, which is a company in El Segundo, uh, so not too far from where I grew up in school. Um, and Aerospace uh, is a nonprofit that supports the entire like space enterprise. So we support um, like commercial companies, so like Boeing and SpaceX and whatnot, but also like the U.S. government, um, Space Force, and so we kind of have a hand in anything like really space related, uh, and even some like non-space related projects where it's meant to be like, I guess the technical experts um, that support these other uh, companies in this industry. Um, so it's been really cool because we get to work on, I work on many different types of projects on like rockets and satellites. And it's really cool to get that, you know, such a variety of experience. And then I'm also uh, getting my master's at USC. So I'm also in school part-time. Wow, awesome. Yeah. Well, thank you, Roxana. This is this is amazing. Um, I mean, I'm so impressed with just learning a little bit about you before actually getting to talk to you and then talking to you. Um, it's even uh, more. Um, it's just really impressive. And and the fact that you're willing to share your experience with others while you were still in, in school and then you know after the fact uh, now is is really um, generous because as a student and somebody that's working full time, we know that time is precious. So thank you, thank you so much for sharing your experience with us. Yeah, no, thanks for putting this together and having me. Um, I enjoy doing this sort of thing. This is like fun for me. Also, I, as I said, I remember I was like in that position when I was in like middle and high school and I did a lot of like reaching out to people who I guess would have been like, you know, in the jobs that I am now. So yeah. I, I, I feel like it's like my duty to like give back and be that person who we were so lucky to have. Um, when I was a student. Now we're going to show you how to make a simple circuit with stuff that you may have at home. All you need is a small light bulb, like from a flashlight, a battery, and some aluminum foil that you can fold up and use as your conductor. To create our simple circuit, we're just going to tape the aluminum foil to the base of the, the negative end of the battery, secure it, and then we're going to wrap the other aluminum end to the top of the light bulb, the base of it, make sure it's secure. And then we're going to go ahead and push the base of the light bulb down. Voila, you've closed your circuit. Now what you can do, here's a challenge, is see if you can figure out how to include a switch to allow you to turn your light bulb on and off without disconnecting it from the battery. Good luck, have fun. <laughs> it was so nice to see my friend and colleague uh, at Sea Grant, Maria Magridal, uh, interviewing current USC master's student, Roxana. And I loved learning more about Marlink, uh, such an innovative project about trying to communicate underwater, which as a scuba diver is usually limited to hand motions. Uh, so the idea of being able to communicate with lasers is fascinating. Um, thank you again to all of our partners and partnering organizations who made today's event possible. Um, some of the people that we had today just to review um, was FTC Lockdown, uh, South Los Angeles Robotics, Susan Casey with her uh, invention, uh, kid invention book, We STEM, LA County Public Works, and USCC grant. I hope that all of you learned as much as I did today, and I hope that today's broadcast helps to create more awareness about some of the opportunities that are out there in STEM fields. And just remember in general that STEM is all around us. Uh, so thank you again for joining us today. Remember that if you missed any of our 
any of today's broadcasts or any of our previous broadcasts for City of STEM, that they are on this YouTube channel. So please be sure to subscribe if you haven't yet already. If you want to learn more about what City of STEM is and what they do, please make sure to visit our website of www.cityofstem.org. And of course, we can't leave you without saying a huge thank you to the sponsors that made all of this programming possible. Without you, this event, it would not be possible. So thank you so much for, for spending your Thursday afternoon with us. It's been a pleasure being your host, and I'm Dr. DJ Cass, and on behalf of the entire City of STEM team, because there's, there's a lot of us, and there's a lot of behind-the-scenes people that you have no idea are also helping with this, thank you so much for joining us, and uh, here's a message from our sponsors. Did you see?